And going into informality, according to Santiago Levy, is, is bad in the sense that it um, reduces productivity because uh, going into informality means that instead of going to a job in the formal sector where you can uh, be radically productive, you go into informality, which is usually a, a low productivity works uh, jobs. So, uh, and that reduces the aggregate level of productivity in the economy. So, and where, when, when you have these incentives, then you sort of incentivize low productivity economy in general. This is Santiago Levy's hypothesis. And then, Warren Hanson mentions a fourth factor, which is the China factor, which means that since China entered the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, in the early 2000s, um, China has competed a lot with Mexico in a third market, and that third market is the US market. So uh, uh, since, since um, Chinese um, products are very much similar to what Mexico used to produce, so they are competing against each other in the, the US market, China has some competitive advantage because of the low wages and because, because of the low cost of transportation, and so uh, the Chinese have, have displaced Mexican goods in the US market. And, uh, and, and, and that's, this is the four element that he mentions. So just rem remember which are the elements that Gordon Hanson points out. Tim Kehoe, on the other hand, suggests uh, the following. Suggests that there are inefficient financial institutions. But when he, he talks about inefficient financial institutions, he's not talking about the, s the same thing as Gordon Hanson. This is important, just to keep in mind. If Gordon Hanson is, 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 is pointing out that poorly functioning credit market means that there's no credit to the private sector. Whereas Kiko, what he says is, yes, there is, he accepts that there is no credit to the private sector, but what he says is that that's because the bankruptcy law uh, and some other I mean, institutional arrangements are such that the banks are not, do, do not have incentives to lend to the private sector. So he claims that just making these changes could, be, could help a lot. Uh, and then he emphasizes the, the role of the rule of law, which is considered to be insu insufficient. And, and a bad rule of law is not good because then this disincentivates uh, investment in general. That's why it's important. Uh, he also claims that there are rigidities in the labor market, which means that um, uh, it's, it's very costly to hire or fire labor in the, in, in, in the economy, and therefore uh, people decide, uh, just the businessmen decide just not to, to hire or fire uh, in order not to, have one, to, to fire people later on in a, in a bad uh, uh, in about the uh, cycle of the economy. Um, and four, he mentions falling public investment and problems in the financial system, which is a little bit related to what Hanson was saying. Um, but he also men mentions this falling public investment. But he mentions that, he says, this has been argued, but I, he doesn't really endorse that view. He, he, he basically sticks to the first three elements. Uh, <coughs> So as you see, th there are now many explanations or alternative explanations. Trade markets, monopolies, um, in informality, China factor, etc. Heckman and, 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 and his students, what they argue is the fol are the following are elements. Excessive regulation in labor markets, for example, so that there is a lot of regulation in those markets. High cost of enforcing contracts and law which again, the reason why that's important is similar to the rule of law point that I made before, in the sense that uh, if there are high costs of enforcing contracts and laws, there are no incentives to invest in some areas because then you might have some uh, uh, legal problems and then it's very hard to, uh, to enforce those contracts. Uh, third, is lack of competition and weak, weak infrastructure. Again, in these sectors that, I, uh, that were identified before, like energy, telecoms, financial services, and other goods. And fourth, poor quality of schooling. And they mentioned the PISA results were in which Mexico, I mean, you know about this, in all these PISA results, which is the, this, this standardized exam that the OECD applies you know, to some countries, Mexico is always in, in, in the last in the, in the, in, in the list of countries that, to take these this PISA exams. And they also discuss some other issues, which I'm not going to get into this in here. Um, so, um, well, I want to talk a little bit about something, because uh, uh, this is interesting because Heckman criticizes the Levis hypothesis that I mentioned. He says that doesn't make sense. Levis hypothesis doesn't make sense because I informality is not the consequence, it's not the cause, I'm sorry, it's not the cause of low productivity, as Santiago Levis suggests. He said, uh, what Heckman says is that's the consequence. I mean, it's, people don't go into, into, into formality because there are incentives to go into formality. 
people go to informatics because there are not, not enough jobs in informatics. And therefore, they have to, to resort to this uh, informatics market. And they end up earning lower wages in the informal sector um, as a result of not being enough jobs in the, in the formal sector. So it's more a consequence rather than, than, than a cause of, of low productivity. So it, they are very critical of Santiago Levy's view, and that's, that's why I mentioned this, this is important. This is a view, by the way, which I, I take. I have uh, research on this area which uh, sort of supports uh, this, this, this argument. Uh, and uh, what I have done is to compare wages from people with similar skill levels in both the formal and informal sector. And what you observe is uh, that people in the informal sector tend to earn, earn less as, uh, in, in, the, in the informality than the informality, meaning that they are actually uh, 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 having a cost by moving to the, to the informal sector, which is more compatible with the view of uh, a segmentation of the labor market in which people do, cannot get a job in the formal sector and therefore go to the informal sector as, as a second best option. Um, uh, because if Levy's view were right, you would see um, that people were uh, getting like a benefit from moving into the informal sector. For example, like earning the same level of wage of, of, of gross income, but by no, not paying taxes, having a higher level of net income, for example. And that's not happening. So Santiago Levy's view is not compatible with, with what we observe in the in the front. Okay. Then this is this is the view by um, Chiquier and Ramos France, which are these guys from Central Bank in Mexico, they have all this diag diagram uh, suggesting what, 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 what are the, those problems in Mexico. As you can see, that means, for example, um, what they have is, um, is a reinforcement process. They start with this inefficient institutional design, lack of competition, and market rigidities. They all lead to weak regulation and supervision, lack of innovation and investment, inefficient allocation of resources. And that leads to suboptimal human and physical infrastructure levels, high input prices, weak public finances. That leads reinforces this. But at the same time, all those produce low com competitiveness. And in the end, that generates insufficient growth, low employment opportunities, and high income inequality. So the problem with this, uh, I have, in general, I would say this is right. The problem with this is, is like everything is related to, a, it's like everything is bad in Mexico. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't—I think—I don't think that helps a lot uh, to understand what the, the main problem because it means like it's just like everything is 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 is, is, is not working well in Mexico, and, or everything is related to everything, and that I don't think it helps a lot to understand. To understand uh, but then they mention a few a few examples, which is interesting because um, and it's interesting because that's the way in which discussion in Mexico takes place. These guys from the central bank say, for example, there are three problems. Financial sector, for example. There's lack of competition in the financial sector. And they go into great detail to explain why there is lack of competition in the financial sector. But it, in the end, they say, well, you know, that might be fine. I mean, that seems like to be a problem. But there is a, that's probably the, an, 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 an outcome, which is um, what do we prefer to have uh, oligopolistic uh, uh, sector in the financial sector with low trade to the private sector with no risk. I mean, we're not getting into this front like in the US market with, by lending to a lot of people uh, that actually um, uh, affected stability and was very risky. Uh, so they say, this is probably bad, but this is the best thing that we can get. Uh, and yeah, I think that, that's part of the problem because then uh, something that they clearly identify as a problem they sort of discard it when, when they enter into this question, what can we do about that? Because what they say, yeah, that's probably bad, but uh, uh, probably the alternative is worse, which I don't think that's the case. So I will mean, get back to this later on. And then they, they say this second example that they discuss is the information and communication technology, and they discuss uh, the problem with telemics. I don't know if you know about this situation. The Carlos Cezanne, which is the richest man in, 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 in the world, basically, is the owner of the, the, uh, the private monopoly in Mexico, which is Telmex, which used to be a public monopoly, was privatized, but was privatized without competition, so basically it was granted a monopoly. Uh, he, now they, they have, there is some competition, but he's like the dominant firm in the sector, um, and uh, it charges a very high rates, and it's very costly, just all this access to this information and communication technology in general in Mexico. So um, they mentioned this case as a problem in which the, the, the commission in charge of regulating 
that firm is basically unable to do it because it's actually um, uh, 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 taken over by this uh, firm, which is um, um, uh, basically COFETEL, which is this commission in charge of regulating telecommunications in Mexico, has no enforcement capabilities uh, uh, so far. Uh, not against at least tenants, which is the, the biggest firm in Mexico in, in this area. And the, the third one is, is electricity, which, as I said before, is a public, uh, uh, a public sector monopoly, and it, which is costly again. It's very inefficient in general, and um, and uh, it's very uh, low productivity. And then that increases that. And electricity is important because that's an input for any business in Mexico, for most business in Mexico, and therefore that means that it's costly for all these firms, <coughs> which in, therefore reduces competitiveness in this, in the, for this, all these firms in Mexico. So these are the, the, the products that I identified, three very specific sectors. One, they said it's OK. Two others, which I, they identify as being related to monopolies in Mexico. And, uh, and, and then what they say is the challenge is, uh, a little bit surprisingly, to me at least, is uh, <coughs> they say the challenges and public policies are Institutional change, uh, and we need, and they say we need institutions supporting transparency and efficiency in public spending. I don't know what do you think about this, but this like doesn't follow from any of this. It like, looks more like an ideological thing that they are trying to put into the agenda, which doesn't really that is related to any of this. The second point, the second uh, challenge in public policies is competition policy, and this one is clearly makes sense because of what they were discussing here, which is. Um, uh, like strengthen the, the antitrust commission in Mexico, uh, giving the uh, budgetary autonomy and uh, increase penalties and so on, which is something which makes sense given what I just said. Um, so I like this this conclusion. I don't like this one. And they say labor market it needs to increase flexibility, which again doesn't follow from what the, the discussion. This again looks like pretty much like an ideological discussion. Um, so. Um, so now the, the thing is, which one of these, all these uh, diagnostic, that diagnoses are correct or relevant? Um, and if you ask any Mexican economists, they have their own explanation, okay? uh, which is basically a, mi a mix of all what I, what I have just said. I mean, you think about all the light explanations out there, uh, probably with the exception of um, when I have asked this in a group of students or at conferences. Uh, in Mexico, and basically they say any of these even before they even see what they have, other, others have said, except probably the only thing that uh, is not there, that is always appearing in, this, in these comments, is corruption. But some is somehow in this discussion about the institutions and all that. But, uh, uh, but even, even though that's important, I don't think that can explain the pattern of growth in Mexico, because it's not that we have become, the society has become more corrupt after 1981. It was probably even more corrupt before that. Uh, um, but anyway, um, so but though, from all these discussions that I have just mentioned, I think there are a few factors which really don't make too much sense to be uh, really important. And what I'm trying to do, as you can see, is trying to take in the discussion that I, see, I said is now. I'm not yet saying what me, my position is. Just taking all these, these, these issues have been put in the table by this, all these economists and seeing which, uh, which, of, which of those elements make sense. I mean, I mean, which, are, which of those are relevant. So I could get rid of some of these. For example, the China factor. China factor is fine. I mean, it's true, has affected Mexican uh, goods uh, which are competing against Chinese products in the US market. But I if anything, that's important only after 2001, which is when China entered into the WTO. Before that, China was not even into the agenda in Mexico. I mean, China was not basically supporting uh, that much to the US, or to any anywhere else, but, uh, for that matter. So, um, so it's not that important. And Hanson has some interesting analysis on what would have happened if China had not entered into the WTO and so on. And the numbers he gets are really, really, really small. I mean, the, the, the factor, the impact that, that, that China had in Mexico Strait is, is somewhat important, but it's not that great. Not that relevant at least in terms of GDP. So uh, China has to come in this I mean, this is it's probably important. Some sense it's good to take that into account, but it's not relevant to explain this three year a three decade period of stagnation that we are trying to, to understand here. I will also discard this informality uh, argument because of what uh, Hegman said. I mean, Hegman in this paper, which I really buy this argument, that it doesn't make any sense to think that 
informality affects productivity as, as, a, as a cause, but rather to think that informality is a consequence of low productivity. So, um, and there are also some results on, on a recent paper which some more or less support this idea that informality is not that important. Uh, and it's more a, 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 a cause rather than a consequence. A consequence rather than a cause. I don't think labor market rigidity, which is something that some other authors, as you remember, uh, emphasize a lot. Uh, and labor market rigidity, which is something, it's, it's an item in the agenda that the World Bank has been pushing a lot, which is, the point is, uh, workers have uh, many rights, and uh, is hiring them formally is costly, firing them is also costly, and therefore firms do not decide not to create more jobs. So that's basically the main idea. When I'm talking about labor market rigidity, that's what they say. Uh, so what we need to do is to, to make the labor market more flexible. And making it more flexible is, is, is in some ways um, a, like a moving away from full-time jobs to, to, to payments by the hour, uh, to, have, uh, to, to file them with a severance payment, things like that. Which, as you can imagine, is very hard to do uh, this in some sectors. I mean, in some sectors we have unions which are very strong. So those sectors actually do not accept any, any, any move in, in that direction. That would mean uh, to lose some benefits that they have fight for in, in, in decades, and therefore that doesn't make too much sense. I mean, that would be creating an immediate confrontation with these sectors. Um, but other than that, I don't think that's true. I mean, besides the fact that I think it's quite difficult to implement in political terms, it's also very hard to believe that that's important, and let me show you why. Uh, if labor market reality were an important argument. One thing you could observe, I think, is that um, uh, during this, during, for example, during a, during a crisis, like a recent one that we went through, uh, if that argument were correct, you should observe like a small contraction in the number of formal jobs in Mexico. And if it's hard to, to create new jobs, when the economy started to recover, you would observe relatively small creation of jobs, because it's costly. That's what, they, that's, that's what they are saying. The argument goes, it's costly to hire, it's costly to fire. So jobs should not react that much to the business cycle. Yeah. So if the economy goes down, they shouldn't fire that many workers. It is costly to do. If the economy goes up, they shouldn't create that, business shouldn't create that many jobs. It is it's costly to do that. So it should be like more uh, 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 stable uh, jobs uh, related to the business cycle in general. But what you, what you see is not that. Let me just show you a, a little bit. Of, this is formal jobs. These are total formal jobs in Mexico. First of all, see what has happened from 1994 to 2010, which is the latest data. The to total jobs are here. Total formal jobs are have, have gone from 10 million to 15 million in this period. This 15 year period. This is since NAFTA was enough. That means that in this 15 year period, Mexico has created 5 million formal jobs, which is 50% of the total formal jobs that we had in 1994. So we, we have created a lot of jobs. So it is not that creation, creation of formal jobs is the problem. I mean, we have created a lot of jobs in these past 15 years. This is, this is one thing we should look at. Second, look at the cycles. I mean, it is, doesn't look like it's quite, um, it's quite stable. On the contrary, it looks quite, uh, 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 it's moving a lot with the, with the total activity. And, and, and let me show you that. Uh, here, what, I, what you see here is, the green line over here is economic activity in Mexico. The red line and, and, and this other line over here are um, formal jobs. What you observe, basically, is that they move together. When the economy contracts, total formal jobs contract. When the economy expands, total formal jobs expand. And the stagnation, stagnation in jobs and in the economy. Expansion, expansion in both. So, and, and this is the, the, contra the recent contraction over here. So it is not that the creation of jobs is, is not a problem. So it's the kind of job that we are creating is the problem. So, uh, so that's why I rule out the banks are not, do, do not have incentives to lend to the private sector. So he claims that just making these changes could, be, could help a lot. Uh, and then he emphasizes the, the role of the rule of law, which is considered to be insufficient. 
And, and a bad rule of law is not good because then this incentivates uh, investment in general. That's why it's important. Uh, he also claims that there are rigidities in the labor market, which means that um, uh, it's, it's very conditions. But when he, he talks about inefficient financial institutions, he's not talking about this, the same thing as Gordon Hanson. This is important just to keep in mind. If Gordon Hanson is, 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 is pointing out that poorly functioning credit market means that there's no credit to the private sector. Whereas Kiko, what he says is, yes, there is, he accepts that there is no credit to the private sector, but what he says is that that's because the bankruptcy law uh, and some other I mean, institutional arrangements are such that in the economy in general. This is Santiago Levy's hypothesis. And then Warren Hanson mentions a fourth factor, which is the China factor, which means that since China entered the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in, uh, in the early 2000s, um, China has competed a lot with Mexico in a third market, and that third market is the US market. So uh, and since, since um, Chinese um, products are very much similar to what Mexico used to produce, so they are competing against each other in the, the US market, China has some competitive advantage because of the low wages and because, because of the low cost of transportation, and so uh, the Chinese have, have displaced Mexican goods in the US market. And, uh, and, and, and that's, this is the four elements that he mentions. So just rem remember which are the elements that Gordon Hanson points out. Tim Kehoe, on the other hand, suggests uh, the following. Suggests that there are inefficient financial institutions. And going into informality, according to Santiago Levy, is, is bad in the sense that it um, reduces productivity because uh, going into informality means that instead of going to a job in the formal sector where you can uh, be radically productive, you go into informality, which is usually a, a low productivity works uh, jobs. So, uh, and that reduces the aggregate level of productivity in the economy. So, and where, when, when you have these incentives, then you sort of incentivate local 